What's up guys, this episode we are talking about graphing charts in your Rails app. We're gonna be using a library called ChartKick, which is actually a wrapper around Chart.js, Google Charts, and High Charts. Maybe some other options, uh, I'm not sure. But basically it's a wrapper around those and a helper for you to take your Rails queries and convert that into JSON that those charting libraries can render appropriately. So it's kind of building out an agnostic way for you to do that. We're also gonna use a gem called group date, which allows us to group by day, by week, by hour of the day, and a whole bunch of other things. And it even supports time zones, which is awesome. So that's going to give us the ability to write a single one-liner, like so, where we can say we want a line chart, that we group the users by day when they were created and we display the count. So for each of those days, we get a count in this graph and it takes your active record query, it does the advanced group by day, which isn't part of active record by default, and then it goes and takes that result converts it into a hash and then passes that into the line chart, which sets up everything so that ChartKick JavaScript can go ahead and tell um, your graphing library like Chart.js or Google Charts or High Charts to actually render this out on the page. And you get a lot of other options like pie charts, column charts, bar charts, area charts, and so on. You can even do a few that are exclusive to Google Charts like the um, world map here, so you geographical charts and timelines and all of this is handled for us really nicely by the chart kick library so we just need to install that gem and the group date gem and we'll have access to adding all of this functionality in so let's take a look at an example so first off let's start by adding gem for chart kick and group date into our gem file and save those and then run bundle to install them now I'm gonna open up the users controller here and show you what I've got right now. We simply load up all of the users and then we render out the HTML format of this page. And so if we go to that index HTML users, we can do the same example as they showed, line chart user dot group by day created at dot count. And we can display that on our page but only after we get the chart.js library added to our asset pipeline. So first off, we need to go to JavaScripts, application.js, and I like to do this before required tree. We need to require chart.bundle, which is chart.js, and then we also need to require chart.kick, which will give us access to um, the chart kick stuff so that when that line chart gets run, this will catch it and then tell and detect chart.js and tell chart.js to render that for us. If you'd like to use Google charts or high charts here, you can actually get rid of this chart.bundle line and uh, add the appropriate line from the instructions for adding in the library as needed for Google charts or high charts, but we're gonna use this because it comes with chart kick out of the box. So if we have all that put together well, users index, this will generate a line chart for the data that we have in the users table. So if we look at this, we can then um, see that we have uh, every single user graphed out in our database. And I have data in here ranging back to uh, June 2013. So we have four years worth of data here and that is quite a lot to graph out. So one of the examples that they mention is that we don't have to actually render out all that JSON right in our view. So if you look at this in our view source, this actually has taken and generated a um, chart one ID and this has some JavaScript in there to create a new chart kick line chart called chart one now, of course, what we've got here is a huge amount of data for the chart to render out. So we can see that it's got a ton of stuff that it generated for those four years. And if you have a giant database, this can take a while to query all of that um, if you're looking across your entire data set. So what we want to do here is figure out a better way of handling that. And the way we can do that is instead of passing in the data directly into the line chart, we can actually give it a URL. So like charts, new users, or something like that. We can have a chart endpoint 
for all of the new users and graph those out. And so then this could be what we use for our line chart instead. So we can pass that in, and really we'd want to use the Rails uh, helper method for this. So we want something like charts new user, new users path or something like that. So we need to dive into our routes and create one so that we can have a uh, JSON response endpoint like so. So if we hop over to our routes.rb file, we can create something like a namespace here for charts and we can add our own methods in here. So I'm gonna say like get uh, new users and if we just write that in, it should create a charts controller and a new users action that we can uh, respond to. So if we run rake routes here, we can see that line here at the bottom for charts new users and we have the charts slash new, de uh, new hyphen users endpoint. So we can use endpoints like this inside of our charts controller to generate those and to have those pass back. So if we edit app controllers charts controller.rb we're gonna have charts controller inherit from application controller and we can have the new users line here and this needs to render json with exactly the same query we had before so user group by day created at and we want to get the count on that. And so what will happen now is when we go back to the browser, we will see it says loading and then it makes an Ajax request for all of that same data and then it displays that. So you saw it take a little bit of time where that query ran and so this page can respond immediately and then all of our endpoints can be uh, run individually. If you have a bunch of charts on your page, you can have a bunch of requests running instead so that your initial page load is not super duper slow um, and possibly times out. So that is good and that gets us down to um, a 29 millisecond response for the user's index and that query, as you can see here, took 111 milliseconds to query and do a count across four years of data. As you can tell, some of these queries can be extremely slow, so the benefit of making these as Ajax requests, instead of trying to query all of that in the controller before you render the page, will save you a lot of time. You can give the user a page back to look at. They will be able to see the loading progress, uh, you know, the loading state of the charts while this data is being generated. And then once it's ready, they can see it. So if you have some fast graphs, you can display those immediately. Um, but if you have any that are slow, you can do this so that the user at least knows that it's loading on the page. And whenever the query is finished, you can handle that. Now, another nice piece about this is that if you get a bunch of these endpoints and you have some for users, you can just namespace a users uh, section in here and then you can have a charts slash users slash new um, or whatever canceled or subscribed or whatever and you can have all of your endpoints organized by your model types here as well so if you had maybe episodes like go rails might or whatever you can have your namespaces here and then organize all of that stuff inside of your controllers appropriately um, once this starts to get a lot more complex. And then the beauty of that is that if you do all this, and let me put it back to the route that we have currently, if you do all of that, then in your views, you can just simply render out that chart and this doesn't have to do anything special in its own controller or in the views to query the database. All of that is handled inside of that Ajax request. And so that makes it really easy to put charts anywhere you want in your application. And the data uh, loading is already handled inside of the one controller action that responds to this URL. And since we've got the group date gem here, we can actually change this to group by month instead of by day so that we can get a less dense graph and that will automatically give us this one where it graphs the month. And you'll see that June 1st was their very first month. We had a low month that month, but afterwards we had quite a few more users. And as you can see here, March 2014 was probably our biggest month of all time. So this is really interesting and gives us a nice visual of the trends of our registrations over that four years. Now, what if we want to see what months are the best months 
and do something a little bit different. We can easily go in here and add a new chart. And so we might have one here that is by month. So we can add that in. And so instead of having our charts new users path, we can create a new chart. We can say by month users. And of course you would probably organize that a little bit better, but you would have charts by month users path. And what we can do inside of our charts controller is we can copy this one and we can have a by month users. And instead of grouping by month, we're going to group by month of year. And this will actually give us a graph that shows us which months are the most popular months. And because I've randomly generated data, um, it is actually a lot more stable than you would probably see in your real data on a business. And you'll see here that March is actually the highest month of all of the generated data that I've got. And unfortunately, it just gives us one through 12 and we would like to improve that. So what we can do is we can actually go in here and do a map. And we've got our key and our values for these and the key is going to be that one, two, three, and so on to 12. So for each key and value of this, we actually want to grab the date name uh, or date month name. And if we use that K as the uh, index for the item in the array, our one will be translated to January and February and so on um, based upon the K value, which will be one through 12 in that array has the items one through 12 as the actual values, uh, string values of the names. And then we don't wanna change the number, um, the value, so we're gonna leave that alone and just return the month name and the value. And if we go back to our browser, should be able to refresh that and see that now we get January, February, March, April and May and so on in our graph. So we can go and tweak those values as necessary inside of our mapping um, in our controller. And then the charts can just simply hit that and grab whatever we need automatically. And because this data is not actually contiguous, um, we should probably change this to a column chart to display the data a little bit better. And so if we do column chart, um, here we can see now those months and see which ones are our big ones and which ones are our low ones in a little bit better of manner. Because this is a time period, those lines should connect to each other, but these are actually looking at slices of January for any year, February for any year, and so on. So a different style of graph fits this one a little bit better. And we can do all kinds of awesome things by simply changing it to, say for example, a pie chart. Now this one isn't actually useful if you look at it because you can't tell the differences between it, um, but that can be useful in certain situations. Now, I can't get into all the options and all the charts and everything that you can do with this, but I can tell you that one of the most interesting things that they have, if you go down here, there's a refresh tag, which you can pass in a number of seconds, and that will go ahead and grab your URL's data again every number of seconds that you pass in and update the chart accordingly. So if you wanna graph out the new user registrations, for the last week or the last month, you can actually just have it refresh every 60 seconds and keep showing you the real-time data on that page, which I think is incredibly awesome to have just built into the library. So that makes it extremely easy if you set it up this way, where you have your charts organized nicely in their own namespace inside your controllers, and then your controllers are going to handle all of the queries and so that leaves you with these awesome lines in your views which are only really caring about how that uh, chart gets rendered whether it needs to refresh or not the colors those other options and so you've organized this in a nice way that when you add many charts to your app you have all of the database query stuff set up in the controllers nice and separate from your views and your views only really have to care about how it gets displayed on the page and that is really it so the chart kick library makes all of this extremely easy almost too easy and the group date library makes querying for different data sets um, really, really easy as well. I do want to mention that the group date library has support for time zones. You have to set that either globally or inside of your queries. So you need to pass in the time zone option, which you could pass in from the user model or whatever if you have 
the time zones set to the specific users. You can also customize the day of the week that it starts on as well. And there's a few other options here, like you can grab the last eight weeks worth of stuff or whatever. So all of these have various options that you can use and take advantage of. All of this works out of the box on Postgres, but if you're using MySQL, you need to install time zone support. And then if you're using SQLite, some of this stuff is not gonna work for you. So I'd encourage you to make sure that you're using MySQL or Postgres um, out of the box here. So if you're ever curious, one pro tip before we go is that if you're ever curious what data they're using in these examples, like the geo chart, when it says metal group by country, I wasn't really sure what country looked like. Is it the country name like United States of America or United States or US as the country code or what? Wasn't really sure and so I wanted to take a look at this and see what it actually did. So if you open up view source on the page and you search geo chart, on here, you can see the exact line of JavaScript they use to render that. So let's take a look at this in our console here and you'll see that it was chart to kick geo chart and they passed in a nested array of United States and Russia and Germany and China and France and so on. So these all work um, by the name of the country, but I was kind of curious if you could say, you know, US is 101 or maybe let's change it to uh, 31 and you can rerun that code which will re-render that template now we have the US is 31 and it has appropriately assigned that value to the right country so you can use either one that you like but the way that you can test out whether or not it's going to work or not is you can take a look at the view source view um, for the chart kick website and see what JavaScript they're using and then really you just need to figure out how to generate this type of data on your JSON endpoint. And another thing to point out here is that this example, of course, uses a nested array, but you may actually be returning uh, a JSON object instead. So we can try it with that, and we can run it and say, okay, well, if you have a JSON object, instead of a nested array, that's going to work just as well. Uh, passing that in. So you are free to use either option and take a look at those examples and fiddle with them and see how they work. All you have to do is make sure that you generate this JSON object correctly on your endpoints and you can easily go test those out because they're all set up on their own um, individual endpoints. So that's it for this episode on Chartkick. It was so easy to add these graphs to your Rails app that I almost didn't even cover it because it was too easy and that says something. So I hope you enjoyed this episode and I will talk to you in the next one. Peace.